tonight on Arena, the must-see movies for the autumn. Debut novelist Louise Phillips reviewed and the original Total Recall is tonight's classic movie. Red Ribbons, the debut novel from Irish author Louise Phillips, is a psychological crime thriller. At its heart is a plot featuring missing and murdered children. Arlene Hunt has been reading the book for us. She's with us in studio this evening. Uh, First of all, Arlene, just give us a sense of who Louise Phillips is, this debut novelist. This is slightly misleading, actually, isn't it? Uh, Well, Louise um, is a blonde, bubbly mother and grandmother who um, has come back to writing after a 20-year absence of... Well, she was raising her family and and has decided to uh, come back into writing. She has won a couple of awards. Mm. She's done a lot of short stories and anthologies. And um, so this... But this is... Red Ribbons is her her debut novel. Um, And uh, it's a cracker. It's an absolute cracker. OK, well, let's get into then what's at the heart of this. Missing and Murdered Children sounds very dark. So what's the plot line at its heart? Um, it's, uh, well, it is about missing children. It's about, it's about uh, uh, two girls, uh, Caroline and Amelia, Amelia Spain. Um, both are found in buried in the Dublin mountains and um, it becomes quickly apparent that you're dealing with a serial killer here and also a killer who may have killed in the past before and who will most certainly kill again. In fact, he's evolving throughout the book. Um, it's an interesting novel because it's not just about the murder of these children. It's actually a, a murder about... Uh, it's a story about grief and loss and shame and you know how people are trying to to cope with 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 the life around them. I mean, we, the strongest character I think in the book is a woman called um, Ellie uh, Ellie uh, Brady who is in a psychiatric hospital. And, and that goes. Does that go back a bit in time? Because there are three main voices: the serial killer him, himself, this criminal psychologist we'll talk about in a minute, and then that accused woman, Ellie Brady. Ellie Brady. Does that story go back a bit in time? It does. Ellie Brady's uh, daughter was killed fifteen years previously in the novel, and and it was in absolutely tragic circumstances because Ellie was heavily involved with her her brother in law at the time, and at the time when her daughter was killed, she was more involved with him than she was in raising her daughter, and her guilt about this is enormous. She just literally cannot folk you know she cannot focus on herself she cannot recover she is completely shut down from the world at large she has split up with her husband she has never recovered from the loss of her daughter and, and, and her guilt is palpable throughout the book Do we meet uh, Ellie in a psychiatric hospital where is she at the point that she's narrating her section? When we meet her she's just about to meet a brand new psych- a brand new psychiatrist in the hospital she's been contained in the hospital since the, since the de- death of her daughter and she is on her way down to meet a new um, a new uh, um, psychiatrist and she's nervous about it and very apprehensive about it and she's starting to awaken slightly in the novel you know at the start of the novel when we meet her she's starting to shed some of the guilt and that really frightens her and, and because it, it, she's so tied up in what happened with her child that she can't go forward and so you know when, when we meet her at the start of the book she's the most wounded uh, really you're, 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 the element of pity for her is unreal she's just mm-hmm. such a really strong character and you're saying this, that section of the book is a first par- person narrative that is is it the emotional quality of Ellie that, that made it the strongest voice for you or what made it work so well I wondered about that, but I actually think it's to do with Louise, how she's written her. You know, Louise is a mother herself and she's a grandmother herself. And she has actually spent time, you know, when she was younger, she volunteered in psychiatric hospitals. And I think she's got a really good, strong understanding of of the the sort of psychological balance that these patients are, are, are going through. I mean, and how she speaks about loss and how she speaks about things. She's coming at it from, I no disrespect to Louise, she's fabulous, but she's coming at it from a mature angle. She's not talking about this woman as if she's a 20-something-year-old. She's coming at it from the angle that she's coming at because she has a, a wealth of life experience behind her. So when she talks through the voice of Ellie, you know, you believe her. You believe that this is a woman who has lost her child. You believe this is a woman who has made a terrible, grievous error, what she thought was love. And it turns out that, as she says, as Ellie herself said, it was nothing. That, that moment, that flash of, oh, I think I really love him. It was nothing compared to the love mm. she felt for her daughter. The, the As I said, there are three voices. The second one I want you to talk about is that of Dr. Keir, Kate Pearson. This is a criminal psychologist. Is that unusual in an Irish novel to have that uh, narrative voice in there? 
I think so. I think it's we're getting more prevalent. I think in, I think the Casey Hill books have introduced a, a female um, a criminal psychologist as well. But she's actually a very interesting character in this book as well because Kate is married in the book and she has a very young child of her own. And again, this comes back to feelings of guilt. Um, Kate is very professional. She's very good at her job. But in the meantime, her marriage is crumbling all around her. And, you know, she feels that she's neglecting her son. She doesn't see him. She puts a lot of hours in at the work because she's very involved in finding the killer of these two girls, which is a affects her deeply. Um, she has feelings towards O'Connor, one of the, the police, uh, the, the main police uh, guy running the case. She has sort of unresolved feelings about him. They've been on a case before. Her own husband, th- th- their relationship is really fractured and you can see it splintering the whole way through the book, but her focus is very much on the case. She sounds, uh, Kate Pearson sounds like a character that could come back again and again and that whole idea of the professional and the personal life overlapping. Does she get that overlap well? Yes, yeah, she does. She really handles it very well and it's very believable. You you know, at no point do you think, oh, this is some sort of, oh, she's like Kay Scarpetta. She can just turn it on and she's cold hearted. This is a real flesh and blood woman who's really struggling to hold everything together. I'd actually like to see what she does next because she's she's quite unpredictable. She's intuitive and she's smart, but she's not, you know, sort of, she's not a, a, a you know, she's not someone that you can think, oh, that's unlikely to happen. Or she's going to suddenly pull out a gun and do something. You know, she's a really real individual. We're, we're in contemporary Dublin. Are we in post boom Dublin? Have we any sense of that sort of the economic crash or anything like that? Is it that specific? specifically contemporary. It is quite contemporary and what's really good about it is that you know you're dealing around areas like Herbert Park and there's areas when they're looking up at the houses and stuff like that it's all around rat mines and, and they go to slatteries to talk about things it's actually the, the, Dublin itself is very much another character in the book and it's really well handled and it's really familiar because you can walk around all the places that, that are in the book and they're there they're here you can see them you can sit in the corner where O'Connor and, and Kate have had a few chats about what they're going to do next and sit down in Slattery's pub in rat mines it's actually very good and also where the killer is sitting in Herbert Park watching families you know judging them judging them that's what he does he judges them he judges mothers and he judges how brittle they are because he comes from a fractured relationship with his own mother as well so you know there's all that really a kind of an ominous sense about he's using Dublin City himself Getting then to the killer's voice um, again a serial killer in Ireland it's, it's one of the challenges for any contemporary crime writer because we don't get many serial murders in Ireland no, we get enough that it keep us taken over. But it, how realistic does she make that? Is is it perfectly believable that he would exist and his voice? Um. He is a complex character. He's very, very complicated. He comes from a fractured... He, co- he comes from Wexford for a start, so he's not like he's not a city boy, per se, and he splits his time between Wexford and he splits his time between uh, Dublin. Um, of the three main characters, personally, I would think he was the weaker of it, but only because I believe that Ellie is so strong and that Kate is so strong. Like These are so well written and they're so fleshed out and they're so, you know, that the minute you read them, you completely connect to them straight away. So he doesn't seem as strong as them, but then that's a minor quibble. And, and, and I mean, who really wants to be so connected to a serial killer anyway? But you do want to get into the complexity of the serial killer's mind and and that you want that complexity to be believable. Well, that all that history is there. All that history as to why he does what he does and how he does it, that's all there. And it, it, that builds throughout the book because throughout the book, he suddenly starts to take an interest in Kate about, about say, a third of the way through because, you know, she's obviously in the media. And that sort of arrogance is very much prevalent with him all the way through the book. So you can connect up with him very easily that way. The idea of writing about children being murdered and children going missing, it, it, I mean, the idea of reading that is not very attractive. Well, I don't know about it, it being attractive. Isn't it every sort of person's biggest nightmare, mm. every parent's biggest nightmare, every mother's biggest nightmare that you should come home and, and one day suddenly your child is just no longer there and you have no idea what's happened to them. I think that's the biggest, most frightening thing about anything to do with children is once they're gone, not knowing. And in this book, it's really disturbing to see how much the parents don't even know about the lives of their children because at you know various stages, Kate and O'Connor have to go back and they have to interview the friends again and again. And it's quite clear the friends are holding things back and it's quite clear that the children who have tragically been killed in this book have had developed a relationship with this serial killer their parents have no idea that they've ever come across this guy and they've held all this information you know back from their parents because this is their own little private world and that in itself is terrifying the idea that your children might be out there interacting and engaging with people who only want to do them harm and that comes across very strongly in the book especially with the grief of the parents And is is that interaction online type of interaction or is it face to face? This is kids that are out at swimming uh, at swimming competitions who are out hanging around with their friends you know this is a guy who's quite happy Mm. and very very content to stalk them and so where they live he would think nothing of breaking into their homes to get you know things he gives them gifts he grooms them he's a very very nasty piece of work 
Uh, he sounds like certainly he is somebody you don't want to meet in a dark night, even a bright afternoon, perhaps. Overall, then, as a debut novel, are you recommending this, Arlene? I am. I'm going to highly recommend it, actually. And I'd be very, very interested to see what Louise does next. I think she's got another book coming out next year. So I'd be quite interested to see. This is a really good, uh, really good debut. It's it, it's a phenomenal debut. And I'd be very interested to see what she does next. All right. It's called Red Ribbons. It's by Louise Phillips and it's published by Hachette Ireland. 51551 is our text at RT 